Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, before I start, I just want to make a, a big th uh, thank you uh, to Johannes, who uh, very kindly lent me his laptop. Um, the the uh, very last-minute thing, but uh, uh, it's really helped me. Uh, it's, it's his first um, camp, and literally the first thing he did when he came to camp was sign up to be an angel and do volunteering. So I'm, you know, he's, he's uh, really ins inspirational there. Um, so. I'm uh, Dan Hagen. Um, this, for me, is my second camp. Uh, I came to the, the camp in 2011, and uh, really that, that opened my mind to uh, hardware hacking uh, as something that could, I, I could possibly do. Um, I literally came to the camp with no idea of uh, which end of the soldering iron to hold, basically. And, uh, and so in the subsequent three years or so, um, I've, I quit my job and I, I now um, uh, run a, a company along with my um, family uh, doing uh, uh, wireless control for model railways. And this talk has really come out of the research that went into the power supply side of that. Um, but more importantly, this talk is uh, really to sort of give back to this community, um, uh, you know, just something um, to say thank you for the sort of uh, the things that I've learned from this community in, in that time. So why is, it, why is the talk called Singing Capacitors and Winding Inductors? Well, these are the key components that uh, will generate the signals that we can use to perform these side channel attacks. Uh, and we'll see actually that they're going that they, they almost certainly are leaking really, really important information and they probably shouldn't. So I just want to take you back now to 2013. Uh, Snowden has just revealed himself to be the uh, NSA leaker. Um, and a question that's on lots of people's minds is, does encryption work? And his answer really sent shockwaves through the crypto community. Um, but there is a sting in the tail with this uh, um, this answer, and that is this question about what it means to be to have properly implemented uh, cryptography sy systems. Um, so let's consider all the things that need to be put into a, um, a usable system for a real-world user, and this is this slide really illustrates that that uh, engineering challenge. And as you can see, there's only really one solved problem, and the other problems get progressively harder as we go down the stack. Um, today, we're just going to focus on implementation. The other ones are talks in their own right. And before we look at that, let's just have a, 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 a look at protocols and understand what's kind of missing from protocols uh, that, that would uh, lead us to consider implementation in, in more detail. So uh, it wouldn't be a cryptography talk if we didn't include our old friends, Alice and Bob. Uh, here's Alice and Bob. And they want to communicate with each other, and they want their protocols to ensure um, certain properties, that they have certain properties. For instance, that a, an eavesdropper, such as Eve, can't uh, um, recover information just simply by listening to the, the traffic going between them. Similarly, a malicious attacker, such as Mallory, um, is not able to uh, pretend to be Alice and Bob to the other, other two parties. Um, so what's missing from this? Well, consider what happens at, Bob, at Bob's end of the uh, um, uh, communications channel. So really, it's not Bob that's doing the communication, but it's some device on his behalf, um, and messages go into that device, and messages come out of it. But essentially, the, the assumption is that, that is a black box, uh, and uh, also that that black box contains a secret key that never leaves that, that black box. Now, really, in reality, that, that is a machine. That is a machine that has internal machinery. And as we know about machinery, uh, that can generate all sorts of signals, okay? And these things are known as side channels, and here's just a few of them. Um, and uh, you might notice that quite a few of these ones towards the bottom here are actually ones that have appeared uh, in the last few months. So this is a present problem um, that we're facing. Now, this is a problem that has been around uh, for quite some time. Um, and actually, one of the first, um, the first descriptions of this comes from this book here uh, called uh, Spycatcher. Um, and it concerns uh, a cipher machine known as a Haglin. Um, and this was used by several gov uh, uh, governments uh, um, at the time, in particular the uh, Egyptian government. And I just want to read a few quotes from this because I think it sort of lays 
uh, lays the sort of foundations for understanding how these um, how these attacks might actually be used in in kind of real situations, and also uh, how they work uh, under the hood, as it were. So let me just read a few uh, quotes from that, if I may. So Operation Halt was begun in the early 1950s when GCHQ asked MI5 if they could help obtain intelligence about diplomatic ciphers being used in London. GCHQ hoped that one of, the M of MI5's agents might be able to steal some of the way cipher tape which they could de then use to attack the cipher. I'm sure that with the new high sensitivity microphones we have, it must be possible to get something out of a cipher machine. They have to be reset every morning by the cipher clerk. Suppose we could pick up the sound of the new settings being made. I felt sure that, that GCHQ will be able to use the sounds to determine what is known as the core position of the machine, and from there be in a position to attack the cipher. If we could get the settings of three, possibly four wheels of the machine, they would have broken the cipher. I installed a series of high sensitivity microphones at various distances from the Haglin, as well as a probe microphone in the wall behind it. Each microphone was connected in turn to an oscilloscope so that the sounds it recorded were translated into visual readings. I checked with the post office investigation unit and obtained a complete list of telephone installations at the embassy. There appeared to be one either inside or very close to the cipher complex, so we decided to install special facilities on the telephone and use the microphone to capture the sounds of the cipher machine. The post office faulted this telephone system and we waited for the Egyptians to call the post office. The cipher room was in an annex, the haggling clattering away inside. Three cipher clerks were, were busy operating the telex machine and processing the diplomatic cables. I began to extend the cable, slowly turning my back on him so that the engineer could slip a, the small washer into the receiver to modify it for special facilities. I placed the telephone back on top of his desk, not more than two feet from the haggling machine. I hurried back from the Egyptian embassy to the seventh floor to monitor the sounds from the receiver. It seemed at first to be an electronic haze, but after some fine-tuning, the clatter of the haggling was clearly audible. The new technique of breaking ciphers by detecting intelligence about the machine through technical surveillance became known by the code word engulf. It was a vital breakthrough. The combined MI5 GCHQ operation enabled us to read the Egyptian cipher in the London embassy through the, the Suez crisis. So there's a, a question that is left um, uh, as a result of that, which is how did they get from the sounds that the, uh, the machine made to a determination of the positions of these wheels? Um, and um, we can perhaps look to see a more modern equivalent of this, to, uh, and that is something known as keyboard emanations. So this is the idea that you can uh, take a keyboard and the sounds that it makes, and then determine from those sounds, for instance, what passwords are being entered into the keyboard. So one of the earliest papers on this used a neural network for um, classifying key presses. Um, and so I looked to see if I could actually do a similar kind of thing, um, uh, perhaps on a slightly smaller scale. So I took a, a laptop um, and um, hit the enter key. That makes a different sound to the, uh, well, that's actually the space key. The space key and the enter key. Uh, I did that until I was basically bored. Um, and so I've got some training data there, essentially. Um, and then I, I then compute an FFT over each of the individual uh, key presses. Uh, and create a neural network. And my output from my neural network is one for, say, space, uh, or, one, or zero for enter. And, uh, and I use the training data that I've got there to automatically train the neural network to, to uh, do the classification. Um, so let's actually look at the data that it, it generated. So on the top line, because you can see, it's the enter key, and on the bottom, it's the space key. And you can see on the left-hand column the time domain. It's fairly hard to sort of uh, distinguish the, the top and the bottom. But when we look in the frequency domain on the right, 
you can very clearly see that there is a, 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 a distinguishable patterns between the enter key and the space key. And it's those patterns that the neural network is actually looking at. Each one of the um, FFT bins, as they're called, is being used as an input to the neural network. Um, so how well does the, our uh, little toy example do? Well, fairly well. Um, it's, uh, I'm pretty happy with that, and I could probably go on now to, to actually do full uh, password recovery. And there are more sophisticated techniques using hidden Markov models, model, um, hidden Markov models, and so on. Um, this uh, a note at the bottom goes for the code that uh, um, comes as well for the rest of this. Um, it will be online later, but if you really need it now, come talk to me after the talk. Um, okay, so we've just looked at passwords, but this talk is really about cryptography uh, and then acoustic uh, cryptanalysis. But actually, acoustic cryptanalysis really is a, uh, an extension of a type of attack known as a paranalysis attack. So we can learn quite a lot about acoustic cryptanalysis by taking a look, first of all, at paranalysis attacks. And you'll see there's a very slight change uh, that's required to go from one to the other. So let's have a look and see how paranalysis attacks works. So Consider um, what's going on internally inside a machine. This is a NOT gate. It's a CMOS NOT gate, which means the, uh, the, the uh, transistors are complementary. When one is switched on, the other one's switched off. So we tie the input to VCC, or logic one, and current then is, um, uh, rushes into the gates of these two transistors, but eventually dry, uh, 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 goes towards zero. Uh, and current is then sunk from downstream gates. Okay, so. Then what happens when we connect the input to ground, so that that current then is sunk uh, down to ground from those, those gates, and we then uh, um, source current to the downstream uh, uh, logic gates. Okay, so the take-home message from this is power is only consumed when switching occurs. Okay, Or to put it in other terms, if data doesn't change from clock cycle to clock cycle, we expect there to be proportionately less power consumption than, the, than it would be if data was changing. OK, so how can we exploit this, this property? Well, let's look at a toy example here. OK, and in, in this toy example, we'll focus first of all on the second step. OK, so we're going to measure uh, the power consumption of this last operation, which is taking a constant register R0 and clearing out register R1, okay? And what does that do? Well, um, basically the power consumption will be proportional to the number of bits that are set in Z. Now, how are we going to use this? Well, at the top, our first operation is taking the exclusive or register R3 and, R and R2. R2, which is values X and C. Now, X is supposed to stand for something unknown, something that doesn't leave the machine, either the key or something derived from the key. And C is something chosen, or it's the ciphertext, but it's something that we can actually uh, change in the system. Okay, So let's, let's consider, then, um, what the operation of exclusive or, which is what's been used here, actually does. So when uh, C is 0, when a bit of C is 0, X and Z are the same. But when C is, is 1 or set, um, X and Z are, are the opposites of each other. So we basically have a mechanism here for flipping the bits in X, putting them into Z, and now measuring how many bits are in Z. Okay? So let's look at an example here. In this example, we start off with C as all zeros, and this gives us a baseline. So in this example, two bits are set. So we know that there are two bits set in X. Okay, we first flip the, the least significant bit of C, and that results in three bits. So what does that mean? Okay, well, the only bit that has changed in Z is the least significant bit. And we now know that, that there is uh, one more bit set than there was in the previous one. So that must mean that that, that is one. And we know that C is, doing a, is flipping the value in X. So we have our first value in X. That must be a zero. And if you look at the, the remaining um, uh, measurements, you can essentially read off the value. It's going to be zero, one, one, zero. So there we go. That's a toy example. Is this practical? Um, not really, because it requires us to know a lot of internal details about this machine. And also, we need to get the timing quite precise. And actually, if you think about a, a modern processor, it can allow out-of-order execution and all sorts of other uh, things. So th this is not going to be practical, but it actually um, it, it contains within it the, the sort of main ideas for, for a lot of uh, uh, the, the, the attacks. So, 
let's look at a more practical, and this is an actual um, uh, uh, setup that I put together. So what did I do? I used a, an AVR microcontroller. Um, I created a naive implementation of AES. Now, maybe you don't know what AES is. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, detail later on. But just for now, some encryption algorithm, OK? Um, we use one pin of the microcontroller, and we sample that. And whether that was set or not, that sets or, or, or resets the least significant bit of the key that we're using. Okay, so this allows us to, to see the difference between what, what difference that actually makes. Um, we use a, um, a, a what they call a current sense resistor, a um, very small value resistor, and we use that to measure the current going through that resistor. And we use a fairly standard uh, digital storage oscilloscope and a bit of Python um, scripting uh, to, to get that data. Uh, and then finally, we use one pin of the microcontroller to synchronize together all the, the traces that we're going to, to uh, measure. So just to uh, zoom in on that, that uh, current sense resistor, notice how small this loop is. That's just to uh, minimize the amount of uh, um, noise that might go into the system. OK. So this is the data that we, we gathered. So we, we've gathered. Um, 2,000 runs for, and the, at the top right, it's uh, when the least significant bit is zero. I should mention also that the, the key is all zeros, and the, uh, the plain text is only, only doing the encryption, not decryption. So the plain text is also all zeros, okay, in this, in this particular case. Um, but the only difference between the, the, the top left and the top right is that um, that bit is either zero to, on the one hand or uh, uh, one on the other hand. So um, what you can see in the, in the bottom left is the difference between these two. Now, if you think about it, if the data uh, did not cause changes in the, in the power consumption, that should be a straight line or, or as close to a straight line as we could, we, we could imagine. But it's not. We actually see some spikes in there. And those spikes indicate where um, the, uh, the, the data differences result in power differences. OK, so let's just zoom in a little bit more on, 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 on what's, what's going here. So um, you'll notice here the, um, uh, unfortunately, the, the, uh, uh, the axes are going in the wrong direction. Um, this is where the, the, um, the processor is, is in sleep mode. Uh, this is where the processor is actually doing encryption. This little spike indicates where we sample uh, that pin to determine whether or not we set or unset that least significant bit. Uh, and as you can see there, that's the, that's the difference between the two. So looking, zooming in it now on the, um, uh, the detail of those uh, top two, what you can actually see here, uh, if you know a little bit about AES, um, you might be able to recognize the first section is what's known as key expansion. And then you can see individual rounds of encryption happening there. So that gives us timing information. So even in a very simple setup like this, we can determine lots and lots of information from just from looking at the power, uh, power consumption. OK. so. Um, this, this type of uh, um, setup is, is used in something known as differential power analysis. Um, so the basic idea with that, uh, very similar to what we did there, except um, we put lots and lots of um, uh, data into, into our system, or lots and lots of input into our system. Um, and then we, uh, we look to see uh, what we, so we make a sum, uh, um, hypotheses about uh, what the key might potentially be. OK? And based on those hypotheses, we infer some changes that might be observable. So that might mean that um, uh, the, the, the most or the least significant bit, or whichever bit it is, might be set or unset. And we use that to partition our set of traces. And if our hypothesis is correct, then the difference between those two traces will be much greater than it will be in the other cases. And the more traces we take, uh, the, the um, more significant that those differences become if we, if we pick the right hypo hypothesis. Okay, so that's differential power analysis. Um, and we've just looked there at a, a, a symmetric uh, crypto system. Let's look at um, uh, something known as module exponentiation, which is required for uh, RSA, um, for public key crypto systems. So um, you might be looking at this mod n business and you're thinking, what on earth does that mean? Okay, well, you're all experts in that because if I was to say to you, 
Um, the first day of the year is a Monday. Tell me which day, uh, day of the week the uh, 100th day is. Well, you'd be computing 100 mod 7. What you'd do there is you'd repeatedly subtract 7 from 100 until the value you had was less than 7. That's all mod does. However, you don't need to know that, really, to understand what's going on here, because it's the exponentiation part we, we, we're kind of interested in. Now, um, if I were to give you the value y in this case, and I was to say, what is the value of x? That is, it turns out to be a quite hard problem. It's known as the discrete log problem, and it's what gives RSA uh, its, uh, its security, essentially. Um, so um, remember that in a second, because it will be important when we discuss the, uh, the, when we discuss modular exponentiation, making that efficient. So how do we make it efficient? Well, the naive approach is to multiply the base by the exponent, um, by the number of uh, the number in the exponent. Um, so in this first example, we're looking at a uh, where the exponent is a um, a, a, a power of two. Um, so we can recursively group pairs of uh, terms, uh, and so we see that we've gone from four. Uh, well, actually, three multiplications to uh, uh, just two there. And you can imagine with very much larger numbers, that becomes even more efficient. Uh, if we don't have a power of two in the exponent, we can, uh, ex we can um, factor out into powers of two, expand, do a little bit of um, uh, uh, rearrangement. And we end up with a standard form, which is basically um, starting from the most significant bit of the uh, binary expansion of the exponent. Uh, and so we. we uh, we basically um, square at each bit as we go along, and we multiply only if that bit is set, as you can kind of see in this particular example. OK, so um, this, this sounds great, because it means we've gone from um, very, very large uh, multiplications. Remember, um, x could be a 2048-bit number, or it could be a 1496-bit number. So this is great. We've got a really efficient uh, way of doing this, but turns out this is really, really bad in terms of side channels because these numbers aren't going to be implemented by particular instructions on this machine. They're going to be implemented in software, and actually it's possible to have a slightly different implementation for squaring than it is for multiplication. So if you can observe that, you can basically, you can basically read off the value of x by just looking at the differences between exponentiation, sorry, between multiplication and squaring. Um, and so, yeah, basically, um, the, uh, um, that this leads to you know, the side channel attacks based on that. Now, I'm more, uh, and the, the point being is that uh, they don't have to compute the discrete log. You, don't, you can get x without having to do that um, in that case. So the most recent paper on, um, uh, acoustic cryptanalysis essentially used this idea, but in a more sophisticated form. Uh, this is attacking GNU PG um, and the, the particular implementation. Again, coming back to this idea that the implementation is what, what's letting it, uh, letting it down. Um, okay, so that that was power analysis attacks. Um, now, how do we switch from power analysis to uh, acoustic cryptanalysis? So um, we want to replace that that resistor, which is in the power line, and we don't have we may not have access to the power line. We want to replace that with the power supply itself. Um, okay, and so we need to understand how power supplies work. Okay, so that, let's look at internals, and we'll think about this from the perspective of a control systems engineer. Um, so a control system en engineer looks at it in a sort of block form like this, and it's a sort of uh, a ubiquitous design pattern um, that's, that's found in control systems. And you, you've got your output, that might be your, your voltage, and you have your desired goal. You know, it might be you want to get 3.3 uh, 3 volts and keep it at that. Um, and you're using feedback, uh, you're measuring that to ensure that you keep the output uh, steady in the face of external disturbances. And actually, it's really, really important that uh, if, if, if this external disturbance pushes that output um, away, you want to be able to react to that quickly. And you can only do that if your control loop has enough uh, bandwidth in it. So that bandwidth is important, and it's important for us because actually that bandwidth is the same bandwidth that's available to us um, uh, for this particular side channel. And we need as much bandwidth as we can get away with. Um, so here's a, a so-called linear power supply, um, and you can see that that that, uh, that control uh, control loop and the feedback directly. You've got the two feedback resistors, uh, you've got the reference voltage, and you've got this pass transistor that we're, which is ba basically our, our plant. Um, 
This turns out to be not very useful for acoustic cryptanalysis because uh, these types of power supplies tend to be fairly uh, uh, noise-free. Not completely noise-free, but tends to be fairly noise-free. What we're interested in is a switching power supply. Um, now, this is a buck converter, which I illustrate uh, through the medium of My Little Pony. Um, and as you can see here, um, when this um, uh, a MOSFET uh, pass transistor is actually switched on, um, the, uh, the current uh, goes th through this inductor, and the inductor is the main uh, component that's actually sort of driving this, and it ramps up. You can see this in the, in the bottom graph, bottom right-hand uh, graph there. Um, and then we switch, switch the transistor off. The c current continues to go th uh, around, because that's how inductors work. Um, and th that, that switching that occurs has um, very sharp edges to it, um, and those actually ha induce harmonics, and so you've got lots and lots of noise in the system inherently. And uh, there's, there's modulation of that uh, through this uh, feedback and the pulse width modulation. Okay, so how would we uh, measure the bandwidth that's in a power supply like this? So one way to do that is to look at the, uh, the feedback uh, loop, and we can uh, inject a, a signal into that feedback loops, loop. So we take a signal generator and a transformer and have a little a resistor um, uh, uh, just in that feedback loop, and we're going to have this, uh, we're going to sweep through all the frequencies that uh, um, uh, we, we're interested in, and we'll see what happens when the, um, uh, when the signal goes through that, that, that control loop and comes out the other end. So, uh, it could be that the signal is, um, uh, has higher amplitude or lower amplitude. It could be phase shifted. Um, one particular thing we want to avoid, for instance, is that the signal goes through that control loop, is higher amplitude, but it is in phase, because when it goes through again, it's going to be even more uh, higher amplitude, and when that's going to be unstable, it might even oscillate. Okay, so. Um, the control system engineer will create something known as a Bode plot uh, and will basically look to ensure that there's enough margin there. But he can use that plot to determine how much bandwidth is available in that power supply. Okay, so we've, we've, we've got a power supply uh, theory behind us. Let's look at an actual power supply. Um, this one has, this is an evaluation module and it has the uh, connectors so we can put our function generator on there. And you can see there the, uh, the various components we've put, put, put there before. Uh, look in particular at the uh, the inductor and the, the capacitor, those are the things that are actually going to generate the noise in the system. Okay, um, now I put this onto a, um, uh, onto a, uh, sort of, well, a, a setup basically. Uh, I've got a box there that resonates, so it, that amplifies the sound. I've also got a cone. Now, if you look at this, you kind of think, well, doesn't that look a little bit like a gramophone? Uh, and that's no accident, because really, if we're going to use a function generator, we could also use an MP3 player or, or uh, uh, some other device like that, as I've got here. Uh, and so let's see if we can play some music through our power supply. Um, so what I did is I took a, a track, I, I pitch shifted it, because the frequency response at the low end is not so good. And this should be what it sounds like. Okay, you may not be able to hear that so well, but that's that's um, a, a sound a recording by a, a blues singer called uh, Bessie Smith. Um, if you want to actually hear this, um, thank you. Um, if you actually want to hear this uh, um, live, I have all this equipment with me, so you can actually come along and uh, hear it um, with your own ears. Um, okay, so. Um, uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So, what actually causes uh, these components to generate this sort of noise? So, there's two main ones. For inductors, we have something known as uh, magnetostriction, uh, and then for capacitors, particularly ceramic ones, multi-layer ceramic capacitors, the piezoelectric effect actually is uh, what kind of generates this. And there's a sort of reciprocity there. So, if you if you hit a circuit board that's got these sort of capacitors, you can induce um, uh, uh, voltages in or currents into those systems. Uh, okay. So. We want to now measure the, um, uh, 
uh, measure the, the, the sound from our power supply, okay? Uh, and we also want to measure that at a distance. Um, uh, and um, we don't want to... We, we, using a uh, normal microphone, like the one I've got here, uh, is not going to be any use because... Well, it's not going to be as much use as, say, an ultrasonic microphone because um, th basically the, those frequencies are going to go way up into ultrasound. So we need an ultrasonic microphone, and they are expensive uh, to buy. Even the cheap ones are moderately expensive. You can get, you know, get them for maybe 150 euros or so. Uh, if you're just playing with this stuff, you probably don't want to spend that amount. However, um, the uh, wildlife recordists uh, have uh, already gone ahead uh, and uh, thought about this problem, and they've come up with um, this particular, they've used this particular module, and there's other examples you can get there, but these ones, uh, they've de determined that they actually have quite good frequency response beyond 20 kilohertz, which is the normal limit for, for these kind of um, uh, microphone capsules. So I wanted to build my own uh, microphone around this capsule. And so uh, this is the analog, um, signal path, we have to increase the, um, uh, the gain. So you ha have some gain and basically increase the signal. And uh, we want to put this through a, a, a low-pass filter, an anti-aliasing filter. Why do we need this? Well, um, think about what happens in a, uh, like an old Western movie. You're, um, uh, you're, you're viewing that at 25 frames per second. Uh, and a wheel on a wagon goes around much, 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 much faster than that. And so it can appear to be going uh, either backwards or it could be going slower than it's actually going because you're not, you're, you're, you're not sampling at, at, at high, a high enough rate. Okay, so in our case, we want to make sure that any higher frequencies than the ones we're interested in are, are, are filtered away. So we're looking at 125 kilohertz of bandwidth. Um, that's, that's a pretty respectable amount of this kind of microphone. Um, there's the detail. Um, I don't expect you to take all that in at the moment, but if you want this, this also uh, will be available uh, as part of the source code uh, to look at. Um, but it very closely follows what that uh, previous diagram showed. So on the digital side of it, um, we're using an uh, ARM microcontroller that has a hardware timer. Notice that we're sampling at 250 kilosamples per second. That's because um, our, um, uh, we, uh, because we, uh, our highest frequency is 125 kilohertz, um, we need to ma maintain what's known as the uh, Ny Nyquist criterion. So we have to sample at twice the rate. Uh, so that's why we're, we're running at that twice the rate there. Um, so we put that into a, uh, a ring buffer. Um, that re uh, reduces the, um, the strictness of our timing, so we, we, we don't have to be quite so, so uh, synchronized in that timing there. We have a bit of glue logic here. Um, if, if you can find a way of getting rid of that glue logic, because there is a, a USB uh, FI on board this device, uh, good luck to you. I've, I had difficulties doing that. Anyway, so there's, there's um, our, our glue logic that uh, interfaces to our main host processor via USB. Uh, and then the, we have a, a, a stack of uh, uh, drivers uh, going from the USB side all the way up to um, uh, 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 wrapped um, uh, uh, code for uh, using with NumPy and Python scripts and the rest of it. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, and uh, the final thing we need to do is we need to make, make sure that we can actually re record a, a distance, okay? So what we actually need is uh, essentially something that uh, uh, has high directivity. So we could either use a shotgun mic, but for ultrasound, you might have to sort of scratch your head and think, well, are those um, slots the right uh, uh, um, distance apart and the rest of it? Easy way of doing that is to use a parabolic reflector. Uh, so if, if you uh, notice that the, uh, the focal length of this uh, reflector is uh, uh, five centimeters, and for 20 kilohertz and above, we can fit several wavelengths inside, the, um, inside that um, uh, uh, focal length. That, that indicates to me that this would actually be quite good for ultrasound. It probably wouldn't be good for normal speech, okay? Uh, and um, so I've sort of tested it, but not really, really long distance. Uh, if you want to uh, test this later on, come talk to me. That would be a good, uh, good thing to try out. Um, so here's, here's more close-up pictures of that. 
Um, so I tested, it, uh, tested the sort of frequency response using uh, a rodent repeller, um, and you can see quite a nice, pretty sort of spectrogram there. Um, and there's a sort of little animation that goes with that. Um, and you know, we can do a sort of real-time FFT. It's quite quite good fun to do that kind of stuff. Um, now. Later on, we're going to uh, uh, very short in a short while. We're going to want to look to see how we can actually um, do the signal processing on the acoustic cryptanalysis side. So it's important to understand when we've got a um, uh, when we we're actually picking out particular frequencies. Um, we want to think about tracking that frequency over time. So uh, that 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 might uh, the amplitude might go up or down, and that might be useful for us. So. If, if we were to take our uh, FFT frame size to be the entire sample, that gives us no locality, so we, don't, we can't really measure a period of time. So uh, reducing the frame size um, gives us greater locality, but we then sacrifice um, resolution. I think this is potentially related to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So I'm, sure, I'm sure somebody will correct me on this. And then um, the other problem we have, if we, if we abruptly um, cut off our, our sample, we have these side lobes, as, they, as they're called, and that's not inherent in the, um, uh, in the signal. So we use a windowing function to make sure that we only uh, get the frequencies that we're interested in. OK, so finally, we can actually talk about acoustic cryptanalysis. So <laughs> let's actually look at, um, go back to um, AES, and this is just a very brief outline of what AES in includes, OK? Um, I want to focus on this thing uh, uh, called the S box lookups or the, the substitution box lookups because actually it turns out that they are where um, uh, sort of the, the, the pivot for, for how we actually um, can get uh, data uh, out of our system. So um, there was a paper by uh, Daniel Bernstein uh, looking at um, something known as a cache timing attack. And the idea behind this essentially is that lookups. Um, it, it, uh, in, in lookup tables, actually depend on the index you use in those in those lookup tables. So um, S boxes are essentially implemented uh, as lookup tables. Okay, so uh, and they actually use the uh, key, the key or a value derived from the key to perform that lookup. Um, and so uh, essentially, um, that's what we're going to use here to to do this this the particular side channel attack. So. Um, uh, just reiterating what I said there about the S boxes. The other thing to mention is actually you can combine lots of those stages that we, we looked at in, uh, in the outline um, to make very large um, uh, um, uh, lookup tables. Um, and the problem there obviously gets much worse. And uh, in particular, those lookup tables uh, don't fit completely into L1 and L2 caches. Okay, so that, that's how the timing differences, you know, the cache misses cause those timing differences. Um, Okay, it, this this is actually a current um, sort of live problem or an ongoing problem in the sense that, for instance, the recent TrueCrypt audit showed that this was a problem with TrueCrypt. So um, it's something to again, it's the implementation side of things that's letting us down. Um, okay, so how do we actually do this this uh, attack? So we've got a secret key and a, a plain text, and um, the time to do this S box lookup depends on the value A, as we said. Okay, so first of all. Um, well, let me just uh, move forward here. Actually, we've got we've got two phases in in the uh, in the attack. Right? The first phase is to compute uh, uh, the, that distribution S essentially. So pre-compute what what that distribution is. Now, think about um, one example of this: the the one that maximizes the the time to do the uh, to do that lookup. Okay, and actually, um, if we think about the very first S box lookup that happens. It turns out that is really well correlated to the overall runtime of our encryption. Okay, so we we already know what the particular index that's going to maximise S is, uh, and um, uh, so we already know what, what index is going to maximise S. Um, and then in phase two, essentially, if we um, if we pick out, or if we if we rerun this, but with uh, uh, um, the key being fixed, but then t um, lots and lots of different uh, um, uh, plain texts, then actually uh, we can compute a new distribution, and there will be one 
uh, a value in there that's going to maximize the runtime. Uh, and that then allows us to go back, un unwind the exclusive order operation, and then recover at least uh, that value for the, um, of the key. And we can do that for all the other bytes in the key. Um, uh, and so, yeah, and so that's basically the, in outline how, how that attack works. Now, just think about what this actually requires. All it requires is us to know the runtime of our, of our um, program. Okay, so uh, let's, let's look at how we can actually do that. Now, this is an actual sort of uh, experimental setup. Uh, I've got a motherboard here. I've taken everything out. I've even made my own heat sink to get rid of the fan, um, basically just so that I can have that as quiet as possible. And I've got a... Um, uh, a power brick. Again, I put it on a resonator to increase the sound. Uh, and I'm now going to sort of send packets to that and see how long that, that actually takes to, 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 to run things and see if I can actually measure that just through the power supply. So just, just to show you uh, here in uh, 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 this sort of, if you like, a sort of proof of concept of that, that part of it, in the bottom left, we're going to show starting and stopping a program. And in the Bottom right, that actually tells you the CPU load, so um, you know, whether it's 100% or, or so. And then the top is our real time FFT. Okay, so let's just run that animation. Uh, there we go. So focus at the top primarily, and you'll see just now, yep, there's a phase shift there. Not phase shift, sorry, a frequency shift. And that occurs uh, just as we stop the program. So we start, we're going to start the program again. Okay. Right, so you can see the CPU load go up to 100%. Okay, and then we'll see again that uh, when the program stops, we'll actually see that phase shift happen again. So the frequency shift, I keep saying that. There we go. So that, that frequency shift just happened there. So well, basically, we can track that, and we can use that to measure how long our program uh, uh, runs. So that is how we can use that to basically uh, 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 determine the runtime of the encryption. And from that, we use that cache timing attack to recover the key. Um, OK, so how do we, so to, just to summarize and to, to, to to fin finish things off here, how do we uh, mitigate this? Well, don't use Xbox, Xbox, uh, Xbox lookups if you, could, you can avoid it. Replace it with something else that um, uh, can require constant time. Um, if you're actually a hardware uh, manufacturer, uh, think about using different types of uh, MLCCs that don't have this problem. You can actually parallel up MLCCs if they do have this problem to reduce that somewhat. Uh, and there are other techniques for doing squaring and multiplying. For instance, Montgomery's ladder, but there's more sophisticated ways of doing that. Um, OK, um, so conclusions. Uh, really, it's to say that uh, implementation details matter. Um, uh, and uh, really, uh, I want to kind of encourage you to play with these, these kind of ideas. Um, uh, you know, try to make uh, your own sort of setup and see what you can, you can achieve from that. Um, yeah, and so basically that, that, um, that's, that's the, the, the key thing. So implementation and uh, play with the ideas, basically. So just want to uh, credit for the various slides there. Questions from the audience? Thank you. Yes, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, yes, we have a lot of time for Q&A. Uh, if you have questions, please come up to the microphones. If you don't have questions, please keep seated, because uh, everything else would disturb the ones that, who have questions. So the microphones are here in the front. Um, until then, I'll make just the normal announcement. Please, if you go, keep your trash with you. Remember the thunderstorms. and. Um, yes. Um, again, maybe I don't. You don't have heard it until now. Uh, yes, the Zigelei is quite happy with us, and they think we are good people here. So now there's a question. Um, just some. As we aren't building our own power supplies for our own laptops or sure. writing our own in, um, implementations of the AES 256 algorithm. Yeah. What are you suggesting we do as normal users to protect ourselves from this sort of attack vector when we aren't building our own hardware or writing our own algorithms? 
Um, okay, so I mean, to kind of take the example of uh, sort of TrueCrypt there. I mean, that's that. Um, that's an example where um, you've had sort of uh, independent audit of that code, and that that has kind of identified that those, that those uh, problems have, uh, are present. Okay, so as an end user, uh, um, although you can't necessarily change things in your, in your code, although you know, like to that to be the case, you can actually um, find out from other people that know, you know, that can identify these problems and, and basically do the research about which particular uh, products are known to have particular pro problems with them. So um, I, I would encourage um, there to be more auditing, if you like, of, of, of code that's out there in a, in a similar sort of way. But um, yeah, I mean, other than actually sort of building your own hardware and, 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 and testing it yourself, uh, I think there's, there's, there's not a lot extra that uh, uh, can be done there. Um. Should we consider wrapping our power bricks in um, sound dampening foam? Um, so probably not, actually. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think the point is that the... So, to give you an example of how, how many um, packets need, need to be sent to do the sort of uh, attack, the cache timing attack we're talking there, uh, in the original paper, we were talking about something like 2 to the 22. It's quite, so that's going to be quite a long, you're going to be send, sat, stood that, sat there a long time with your, uh, with your microphone uh, trying to listen to these things. Although, although it's possible in principle, in actual practice, it, it's. it's um, uh, there's a lot of effort that require, is required to do this kind of attack, really. And if you see what uh, happens with power analysis attacks, uh, in those particular cases, um, people really, you know, if, if they really want to get into the uh, system, they, they'll, they'll, they'll spend the time to do it. But kind of an ordinary user probably wouldn't see that as part of their threat model, if you like. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question from the other microphone. Uh, for your test setup, you had to remove all the fans and, and everything that made noise. Yeah. Could this be defeated by putting a fan in the power supply? Um, so, if you, so if you look at the, 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 the paper I showed uh, about the, the most recent um, acoustic analysis paper, they uh, actually said that, the, uh, the, that the, uh, in their particular case, the, the, the fan uh, didn't uh, actually make any difference in terms of what they were they were, they were measuring. Actually, so it's, it's it's sort of a very low frequency kind of thing, and it doesn't actually uh, it, it doesn't have enough sort of uh, uh, information coming for, through it to make any difference. In my case, actually, what I was trying to do there, um, I wasn't actually trying to use the power brick at all. I was actually trying to use the power supplies on the board, the switching power supplies there, and. For whatever reason, that particular board doesn't seem to ha uh, have this as a problem. Maybe they use the right sort of capacitors. I don't know. But uh, yeah, um, so um, you don't have to remove the, uh, the fan, but um, uh, it doesn't make any difference if you, if you do, basically. Next question again from that microphone. Modern CPUs sometimes have hardware encryption yeah. instructions. Do, are you aware of any... Um, Analysis of their side channels because they would be a prime target um, for backdoors. Yeah. And did you know of anyone using SEMD instruction? Um, no. To, Sorry, come. Uh, to um, work with the data and its complement at the same time. Um, so I'm not aware of, uh, of any, anything particularly to do with sort of the you know Intel instruction set or anything to do with that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, I, I would actually, I mean, I, I, this, this particular project is something that I've been working on um, maybe for the last sort of six months or so, and so uh, uh, that particular level of detail I haven't really got into yet, but I'm, I'm sure if there are things like that, um, there will be, you know, papers and various things on that to, to look, look for, but, uh, but thanks for the question. Another question from here. Okay, so... If I got your talk right, then the acoustic um, analysis uh, relies on the cache timings uh, yeah. and not uh, what I th uh, initially thought on the instantaneous uh, current consumption uh, like yeah. a DPA or something like that. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, that would also be, or I think that that sh uh, should also be um, visible in, in the SMPS, yeah. but would have a... Um, 
much higher frequency yeah. range. So, okay, so, so the, the, the reason that I've used the cache timing attack here as a sort of an example, sort of suggesting this as a way of doing it, is that uh, I wanted this to, well, as I say, I'm, I'm learning this as I go along, and okay. I wanted this to be as, as literally as uh, the most simplest one I could possibly think of as a way of doing this. And uh, so, here, the only requirement is that you know how long the thing runs for, and it's very easy to determine that from that. However, as we know, as we saw from the from the uh, as we heard actually from the um, the power supply um, uh, playing the music, there is a very rich uh, spectrum in there, and so yeah, you can actually uh, see a lot more uh, information if you're really looking hard for that information. So yeah, definitely, uh, it, it it'll be in there if, if it's uh, if, if it's being transmitted on the power line. Yeah. Okay, but do you know of any um, attacks or, uh, or papers uh, which mention that they um, basically hear the instantaneous current consumption? Oh yeah, I mean, so so if you actually look at that, uh, I go I go back to that that, that paper um, that I cited there, the, the most recent uh, uh, acoustic cryptanalysis paper. They um, they actually um, uh, yeah they, they can actually sort of. See almost in sort of real time um, uh, as as it's computing the uh, the uh, the um, you know as it's computing between different uh, uh, values in in the um, modular exponentiation. So they can actually sort of differentiate those things. You know, almost like a, a DPA attack there, as you say, in real okay. time. So yeah, it, it is possible to do that. But um, I, I would class that as a uh, an intermediate to more advanced level of. Uh, uh, um, uh, skill <laughs> to do that kind of thing. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the question. You have another question on that microphone? Thank you. Good talk. Thank um, you very much. I come from a professional audio background. Okay. And one of the things that's fairly well known is that because of ground bounce and yep. ground noise issues, you sometimes get noises in the recorded audio yep. that correlate with mouse, with mouse movements and such. Okay, yeah, yeah. This being essentially the same, the same thing. Yeah, yeah. The at least partial cure for which is to turn off the deep sleep C states in the BIOS. Right, okay. So the processor does not idle right. as much. Yeah. And that significantly reduces the level of switching of power consumption that you get. Ah, uh, okay. Um, but of course, that, that, that observation from the audio recording scene gives rise to another possible side channel attack here. Yeah. Basically the same thing. Yeah. But using enabling the microphone on the machine. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you know, if, you, if you if you've got a Skype connection open or. Yeah, I mean, I th I, yeah, I guess that kind of comes back to that that idea of, uh, um, yeah, but right back at the beginning, we were talking about with the, you know, the the, uh, the telephone and uh, using that to to essentially get the the, the data. Uh, away from the, the the system under attack, yeah. So using the microphone, and Skype, or something like that. To, to see. Well, except you're not really using the microphone. Yeah. You're using the ground noise. Right. Okay. On, on the analog section on the motherboard. Right. Oh, which okay. On most laptops is appalling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's and interesting. And actually yeah. picking that up and digitizing that as the transmitted okay. side channel. Okay, that's interesting. I'll have to look at it more, into more detail. That it sounds like it could be you know, potential, you know, interesting thing to look at. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thank you for the question. Thanks. And I think this is the last question. At least there's nobody else standing there. Uh, well, actually, it's an answer for the guy that was asking about the fans. So uh, it's about uh, the fans. So yes, yeah. it's an answer yeah. to the guy that was asking about the fans. So hopefully he can understand yeah. uh, why it, it didn't affect the research that they did on the paper. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, there are two things that you should take into account. Uh, fans usually make noise at, mo at much lower frequencies because mm -hmm. they aren't that fast compared to the kilohertz uh, me measurements you were making. Yeah. Uh, but the second and more principal reason is that when you are doing cryptography with a, with a half good algorithm, yeah. uh, you will have approximately the same amount of ones and zeros plus less some error. Yeah. Uh, so when you do a mean measurement as you were doing on, on, your, on, on your own measurements, yeah. uh, you will find out that 
thanks to the hysteresis of the fans, yeah. uh, the amount of, of uh, noise you get when there is a one and when there is a, a zero more or less cancels itself always. Right. So okay. you will get more or less the same amount of noise during the wall measurement after you have done a few of them. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thank, thanks for the clarification. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, that were our questions, and this was Dan Hagen. Thank I you. think he has earned another applause. Thank you.